We come now to the ninth of eleven repeated programmes, and it comes from Hereford Cathedral, where the organist and choir master at the time of this recording was Melville Cook, and the assistant organist, Roger Fisher. Here to set the scene is John Betjeman. The train draws out from under the Malvern Hills into this other country of the West. It's a land of plaster and timbered cottages, remote pink brick farms and many orchards, all in the blue haze that hangs over this broad part of the Wye Valley. In the distance, to the west, are the once hostile hills of that mysterious principality, Wales. Wherever we look, it's deeply agricultural, real country. In fact, Hereford is the most countrified of our cathedrals. The old city round it, so often raided by the Welsh, is now mercilessly assaulted by heavy traffic going from South Wales to the north. Unfortunately, the most prominent part of the cathedral that you see from the main road is the uninteresting rebuilding of the West Front, which was finished in 1908. Every other side of the delightful assembly of objects of different dates which make up the Cathedral of Our Lady and the Saxon Martyr King St. Ethelbert is better than this West Front. And the whole collection of buildings is of a local pale pink limestone which varies into shades of cream and grey. Notice that double porch on the north side with the elegant 16th century chapel above it, nearly all glass. See the tall nave, aisles and transepts under an ornamented central tower, and you'll see how across the east end a long church has been built, only one storey high and with decorated windows, some with medieval glass. And then there's a further, taller building still added to it, the Lady Chapel, in purest early English, with narrow pointed windows like Salisbury Cathedral and about the same date, 1220. But now come round to the south side for a real surprise and something you might easily miss. Hereford Cathedral wasn't an abbey. It was a college of secular canons with a dean and chapter. And these canons had priests attached to them who sang the services in the cathedral and were known as the Vicar's Choral. They went on from the Middle Ages until 1937, and then they died out. And they lived in this 15th century cloistered quadrangle, which is like an Oxford college, only in pale pink stone. The organist lives in one corner of it. The dean lives in this quadrangle too, because he can't afford to live in the big deanery in the close. And the bishop lives next door, in only a part of his ancient palace on the banks of the Wye. And this palace has got its own cloister, the bishop's cloister, from which we'll go into the cathedral. Outside, you saw pointed arches and flowing tracery, all Gothic. Inside, in the nave and south transept, it's round-arched and Norman, a complete contrast once the cathedral had a Norman West Front, like Rochester, but it fell down in the 18th century, and the dean and chapter shortened the West End, and then called in that much maligned architect, James Wyatt, to re-roof what was left, and jolly well he did it. That vaulted roof over the nave, which you'd think is ancient, is by Wyatt. And notice the Norman, too, in the south transept there. It's very plain and early. Whereas here, in the nave, the round arches on strong cylindrical columns grow richer as they reach the four vast Norman arches at the tower crossing. And look up here at the thin grid of stone which supports the inside of the tower. It looks as though it might be by Le Corbusier or Frank Lloyd Wright, but its date is 14th century. The impression of Hereford isn't unified. But so many things in this cathedral are perfect in themselves that I'll just tell you of a few. That lady chapel we saw at the East End is like a bit of Salisbury Cathedral inside. The choir transepts which lead to it are perfect transitional, stone vaulted, 
the beginning of the pointed arch and built about 1190. And the north transept is enormous, thin and tall and like a part of Westminster Abbey and was built in 1260 by masons who I should think probably may have worked at Westminster. On the wall in the north choir aisle is the oldest map of the world drawn on a huge piece of vellum by a monk in about 1290. Jerusalem is marked as the center of the world, the Mediterranean as the chief sea, and in India they've put a skyopod, that's to say a man with a foot he can use as a parasol. The Red Sea is a painted red, and there are no points of the compass. It was done when people thought the earth was flat. Up some stairs opposite, is the biggest library of chained books in the world. I think it's about 1,400 chained books. And it contains medieval manuscripts going back to the ninth century, illuminated and exquisitely written. I haven't had time to tell you of the chantry chapels and the effigies and carvings. We've got to go in and hear the choir. So we'll enter from the nave under a tremendous metal Victorian screen Considered, when it was put up in 1863, the most splendid thing of its kind in the country. And it is marvellous. Here, in the canopied medieval choir stalls, under the Norman arches, we can glance through beyond the high altar to the Lady Chapel. There was always a school at Hereford. And in 1632, a company of soldiers left an account of how they dined and feasted with a vicar's choral, till the bell tolled us away to cathedral prayers. There we heard a most sweet organ and voices of all parts, tenor, counter-tenor, treble and bass, and amongst that orderly, showy crew of queristers, our landlord guide did act his part in a deep and sweet diapason. Let us now hear their successors. Melville Cook now conducts the verse anthem, Almighty God, who by the leading of a star. By John Bull, who was organist here in the 1580s and a very famous keyboard player.
Bull was one of several English musicians of his time who went abroad after beginning their careers here. Bull went to Brussels and later became organist at Antwerp Cathedral. Peter Phillips also worked in these places. The works of both these composers are now part of the repertoire of English church musicians. We now hear Tibby Laus by Phillips and a setting for organ by Bull of a Dutch carol.
We now hear Stanford's Beati Quorum Via. Wesley became organist here at Hereford in 1832, at the age of 22. This was his first cathedral post. We now hear two of his works. First, Roger Fisher plays the fugue from his choral song and fugue.
Wesley's anthem, Blessed Be the God and Father, has for a long time been his most famous work. It was written while he was organist here for Easter Sunday at Hereford. Thank you. 
That anthem by Samuel Sebastian Wesley brings to an end this program from Hereford Cathedral, introduced by John Betjeman.